Thank you, Sanford, I guess. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Prescott Chamber CEO, Sherry Heine. Keep your day job, by the way, <laughs> Sherry. Members of the Chamber Board, fellow council members, elected officials, hardworking business owners, and community members, thank you for inviting me back to the Chamber to speak again this year. Before I go any farther, people always ask me, Greg, how do you do all this? How do you get all this done? How do you get it in your schedule? How do you make it happen? Well, Sanford, you missed one dignitary. I'd like to please uh, recognize and thank my wife, Sheila, for all that she does. <clears throat> you are the hardest working people I know. You are the reason I have hope in our local economy, and I am grateful for all you do for our community and local charities. Before today's comments, I had the opportunity to go back and review my speech from last year, and I'd like to take a moment and repeat my opening statement from a year ago. I said this, throughout my campaign, I emphasized that we live in a unique and vibrant community. The air is clean, the sky is blue, our surroundings are serene, and those that live here are filled with energy, optimism, and kindness. There is no mystery as to why our community is on everyone's best places to live list. It is why all of us choose to live in Prescott. My goal as mayor is to preserve this reality of Prescott while at the same time enhancing its appeal. I went on to say that to accomplish that vision and to have long-term success as a community, we had to do three things. Number one, provide a government mindset that promotes free enterprise. We're still working on that, but that is our aim, is to make sure government facilitates what you do every day, free enterprise. Number two, control our future through strategic partnerships. If you've heard me speak much in the past year, I am all about making sure that we partner up and have great relationships and regionalization as well. <clears throat> And number three, and most importantly, we need to start thinking about the next generation and not ourselves. We need to start thinking about those who will come behind us, not ourselves. In what seems to be the blink of an eye, a year has now passed since I made those statements, and I find the new year provides an opportunity for us to reflect on what has transpired and to look forward to what our future holds. By all measures... Our community had a very good year. You've heard that already today. Let me outline a few of the successes our team at City Hall had working with various partners in the community. Successes that improve our community and create a better place for the next generation. So I'm going to talk about five different areas. The first one is PSPRS, our pension fund. In August of 2017, the voters approved Proposition 443 providing for an additional sales tax to be directed to pay down our PSPRS debt. The first year of the collection of that tax was 2018, this past year. And all of the 443 sales tax collected went directly to pay down the debt. <clears throat> the recent report from the state has shown that our debt was paid down from 86 million to 69 million. I never thought I'd be excited about $69 million worth of debt, but I am. We are on track to pay this debt off in the original timetable set by the proposition. Prop 443 passed because community leaders ran an effective information campaign and because our business community provided financial support to help make that campaign happen. This was a courageous and bold move by our community to address this problem up front and not kick the debt down the road to burden future generations. Our generation created that debt and we have taken the responsibility to pay that debt off completely ourselves. How about regional jet service? 
For decades, our community has struggled with establishing reliable, affordable, and modern air service at the airport. Despite repeated attempts, all efforts failed. But everything changed on August 28, 2018, when a United Express 50-passenger regional jet landed at Prescott Regional Airport. Some of you were on that inaugural flight, and I can tell you it was exhilarating to fly into Prescott on that jet. How many of you have flown on United Express out of Prescott? Good, lots of hands. I hope to see a lot more next year uh, as you continue to use United Express. So how did all this happen at our airport so quickly when we had failed so many times before? I can tell you it was because of a great staff leadership, strategic partnerships with you in the business community, regional partnerships with local municipalities and the county, and finally, a tremendous relationship with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Our team, our team at City Hall had a plan, but it required our partners in the community and region to be successful. SkyWest has informed us that the startup service in Prescott has been the most successful in the company's history exceeding 10,000 passengers in its first four months has given the airport access to critical funding. I am so pleased to tell you that in the summer of 2020, we will open a brand new terminal at Prescott Regional Airport. Planning is currently ongoing to add more flights and more destinations to our air service. This regional jet service will provide new opportunities for our local businesses and universities while providing future generations a gateway to the world. The next area I'd like to talk about is downtown development. Revitalization of the Granite Creek Corridor has been one of the city's top priorities. This area of downtown has been neglected for years because the city la city's land holdings in the area have various floodplain issues. The city does not have the funds nor the expertise to develop this area. As you're well aware, a private hotel group has been in the planning stages of how best to develop a hotel on city property at the intersection of Sheldon and Montezuma. This private partner recognizes the importance of history parks, and pedestrian walkways to Prescott and have presented a great plan that will accomplish all of these goals at this site. If the project goes forward as planned, it will result in one of the largest private investments in downtown Prescott in the past 20 years. But more importantly, the new Hilton Garden Inn will be the anchor for a wonderful park setting along Granite Creek the use of the Sam Hill Warehouse for conferences, and the historic train trestle will be the centerpiece of it all. This project is an example of innovative cooperation between city government and the private sector, and generations to come will benefit from its amenities. The next area I'd like to talk about is open space preservation. Our breathtaking landscapes are one of the hallmarks of the Prescott lifestyle, particularly the Point of Rocks, and other prominent rock features in the Granite Dells. Ironically, some consider these landmarks as ours when in fact the city owns a portion of these iconic rock features. One year ago, the city purchased 160 acres of the Granite Dells. Coupled with 258 acres that the city already owned brought the total Dells holdings to 418 acres, which doesn't include Watson or Willow Lake. But this is only the beginning. In the last few months, an opportunity has presented itself for the city to own another large section of the Granite Dells that would include the Point of Rocks. I'm talking about the proposed annexation of property currently owned by Arizona Eco Development. As controversial as this issue seems to many in our community, we cannot lose sight of the fact that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the city to acquire this privately owned property. It is our job to find a workable development agreement that maximizes preservation of this open space while still providing the developer with the proper incentive to proceed with the annexation. If a suitable agreement can be reached with Arizona Eco Development, 
This acquisition will be a landmark deal and become a tremendous legacy gift for future generations to enjoy. We are going to save the Dells. <laughs> the last uh, area I'd like to talk about is water conservation and management. So you all know the old saying, I'll let you finish the phrase, whiskey is for drinking and water's for fighting, right? One is only to mention the word water and you can start an argument. There is enough water, there's not enough water, where's the water going to come from, what's it going to cost to develop the water. I think we can all agree that water conservation is in our best long-term interest and that we have improved our efforts on this front. As a matter of fact, in 2017, we returned more water to the aquifer than we took out. In 2017, we took out 6,770 acre feet of water, but in that same year, we put into the aquifer through our lakes and effluent treatment facilities, 7,005 acre feet of water. In addition, since 2004, our water usage has decreased on average 2% annually. Now, it's interesting because we're growing at about 1.5% to 2% annually, yet our water usage is decreasing by 2% annually at the same time. So in 2004, we used 81 acre feet of water. This past year, we used 6,770 acre feet of water. We've reduced our usage annually by 1,400 acre feet every year. It's pretty amazing, uh, and, and we have much more to accomplish with conservation. However, even with conservation efforts, we need a plan for the future. We cannot leave this issue for future generations to solve. The first step in a plan is to determine exactly how much water is unspoken for in our water portfolio. I know that seems like an easy question to answer, but no one actually knows. Our water portfolio is like the ledger at a, at a bank. There are withdrawals and deposits. And guess what? There has not been an accurate audit of our water portfolio in decades. As a first step toward understanding our water issue, we need an accurate audit of the water portfolio. And that is currently being done by a recognized expert in the field. We expect the results of that water audit this month and we'll share it with the community when it becomes available. Once we know where we stand on our current water balance, we can project growth and needs for the future. Only then can we develop solutions. So let me be very clear. We must ensure that we have plenty of water for generations to come, and we will do that. I'd like to end my comments today with a quote and a challenge. There's an old Greek proverb that says, Society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they shall never sit in. As a matter of fact, you'll find a similar sentiment in ancient Hebrew teachings and in other ancient civilizations. No matter the origin, the meaning is clear. The best legacy is to sacrifice today to ensure the prosperity of tomorrow. Let me say that again. The best legacy is to sacrifice today to ensure the prosperity of tomorrow. This sentiment has become more meaningful to me because this past September, Sheila and I became first-time grandparents. You can see our grandson there in the middle. He is a very special guy. And I am now one of those grandparents that has to show the pictures. You know, I'm a part of that club, right? So afterwards, you can show me your pictures of your grandkids. So our grandson's name is Dawson August Mingarelli, and his birth gave me pause to wonder. What legacy will I leave behind for Dawson? What legacy will I leave behind for the community in which he will one day become a grandfather himself? So that is the question I ask each one of you. What legacy will you leave behind? What trees are you planting today? What sacrifices are you making today that will benefit those who come behind you? My faith teaches me to put God first, others second, and myself third. I believe when we put others ahead of ourselves, we will accomplish great things. 
I ask and challenge each of you to help make Prescott a better place today, and more importantly, a better place for my grandson and your grandchildren. God bless you all, and God bless Prescott.